I'm Susan Kelly, President-Elect of the City Club. Welcome to another City Club Friday Forum, this time on the subject of global warming. We are privileged to have with us today a true expert on the subject, Eileen Claussen, President of the Pew Charitable Trust on Global Climate Change. Welcome to City Club. We have some new members today. Seated at the new member table, table are um, David Calver, Vice President Parsons Brinkenhoff, Brinkerhoff, Don Brady, retired English professor, Sharon Benson, Director of um, Gifts for the American Can Cancer Society. I'm having trouble reading some of this. Jack Featheringer, uh, Jack, you're with you're retired with your theater professor. That's why I could, thank you. Welcome all of you. One more. And your name is please. I said Sharon, Sarah. Sarah Laberton. Thank you. Account executive with KVO Public Relations. Good. Welcome. Next Friday on the 21st, join us for our annual holiday program featuring the voices of the Oregon Repertory Choir. Please note we will be here in the Benson again, which is delightful, isn't it? The Mayfair Room. We will also welcome gifts or financial contributions for the Toys for Tots program today and next week. Um, please remember to bring your new or unwrapped gift. And we welcome a cash offering also um, that then we will use to purchase the gifts and we have uniformed marine representatives back here to see to it that our gifts are distributed to the most needy children. Um, all of you have a letter, as a recent letter asking you to participate generously in this year's annual campaign fund. We are still $16,000 away from our $95,000 goal and we need not only to meet that goal but to also surpass it. I urge you to write this all-important check to City Club as you do your year-end year in giving. A few weeks ago, we decided to implement the wearing of name tags at Friday forums. You will find blank tags on your table if you haven't already, and please add your name to one and wear it. Um, this is your opportunity to meet and get to know new people, and for them to know you. If you have questions about the club, Board and staff members have the plastic name tags and will be happy to talk to you. Our program host sitting at the head table is Josephine Pope, mem member of the Board of Governors and chair of the Portland Parks Foundation. Foundation. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. Following Joey's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members and guests in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone even before Joey is finished so that we have time to ha ask as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a member or city of City Club and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by the corporate underwriting from Weyerhaeuser, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and Pacific Corps. We are very grateful for their support. Now our guest. Eileen Clausen is president of the Pew Center on Global Climate Change, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. She is also president and chairman of the board of Strategies for the Global Environment. Eileen has served as assistant secretary of state for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs, as a special assistant to the president of the National Security Council, and has spent over 20 years at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency although her career spans 30 years in this field. Ms. Claussen is the recipient of the Department of State's Career Achievement Award and the Distinguished Executive Award for Sustained Extraordinary Accomplishment. She, is, she served as a Timothy Atkinson Scholar in residence at Yale University, is a member of the Board of Directors of the Environmental Law Institute, and currently serves as a commissioner on the Pew Oceans Commission. We are honored to have such an expert with us today. Well, greetings and thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in Portland and I want to thank the people at the City Club for inviting me to be a part of your Friday Forum. I did notice on the club's schedule that the next week's Friday Forum presenters will be the Oregon Repertory Singers. 
I certainly hope that none of you got the dates mixed up. I always try to be somewhat entertaining in my speeches, but singing a few holiday favorites definitely crosses the line. Seriously, I'm glad to have the chance to be here today to talk to you about one of the most profound challenges of the 21st century. That, of course, is the challenge of global climate change. I'd like to tell you where we stand right now in the effort to deal with climate change, both here in the United States and internationally. And I'd like to tell you where we are headed, the kind of world we will leave to our children and grandchildren if we stick to business as usual. But most importantly, I'd like to tell you where we need to be headed, the path that instead will allow us to pass to future generations a safer, healthier, more prosperous planet. It's not a simple path. For what is needed, I believe, is a second industrial revolution, one that takes us beyond oil and beyond coal to cleaner, more secure ways to power our global economy. Governments must have a hand, a strong hand, in launching this revolution but it can succeed only if our corporate leaders rise to the challenge as well. For while government can set the goals, only the marketplace can spur the innovation and mobilize the resources needed to achieve them. Fortunately, a growing number of forward-thinking companies are already leading the way. First, though, I'd like to tell you why the state of Oregon holds such a special place in my heart. Some of you, I'm sure, remember back in the 1970s, when Oregon became the first state in the nation to require a bottle deposit for bottles and cans. At the time, I was a young staffer in EPA's Office of Solid Waste, and I thought, hey, they've got a great idea out there in Oregon. We should let other people know about it. So I put together a nifty little pamphlet describing Oregon's groundbreaking, groundbreaking program, and EPA started distributing it. Well, not everyone agreed that bottle bills were such a grand idea. The beverage industry was, shall I say, unhappy, and they let my bosses know it. I'm told, in fact, that the chairman of Pepsi-Cola raised the matter directly with the president. That was President Nixon. Soon thereafter, EPA decided to loan me to an obscure office in Congress, where I couldn't cause any more trouble. And when I was finally allowed to return, I was assigned a new area of responsibility, sewage sludge. It's really, it's true. I'm pleased to say I was eventually able to rise above sewage sludge. And I'm also pleased to note that all these years later, Oregon is still leading the way on the environment. In fact, I know of no state that is doing more to meet the challenge of global warming. Oregon was the first state to enact mandatory controls on carbon dioxide, requiring that all new power plants meet a tough new emission standard. The city of Portland and Multnomah County were the first local governments in the United States to adopt a plan for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And thro through your commitment to light rail and other smart growth strategies, you are demonstrating that protecting the climate goes hand in hand with preserving Oregon's enviable quality of life. These efforts really do reflect the spirit behind the Oregon State motto, she flies with her own wings. May you soar higher and higher. But are others joining you in flight? Climate change is, by definition, a global challenge, and the best efforts of any one city, state, or nation will come to naught unless, ultimately, we all act together. We're by no means there yet, not even close. But it might surprise you to learn that we are, in fact, making headway. The reason this might surprise you is that the one thing most people heard about climate change over the past year was that President Bush rejected the Kyoto Protocol. His decision, indeed, was a setback. But let's look at what's happened since. First, let's look at the international picture. For those of you new to this topic, the Kyoto Protocol is an agreement negotiated in 1997 that does two things. It sets targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from industrialized countries, and it allows them to meet those targets through market-based strategies like emissions trading. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too far into this. But it's worth taking a minute to understand why these market-based strategies are so important. Basically, they put the market to work to cut emissions as cost-effectively as possible. In other words, they deliver the greatest environmental benefit at the lowest possible cost. And they create market incentives that drive companies to keep coming up with better and cheaper ways to cut emissions. This is how we've tackled acid rain faster and cheaper than anyone ever imagined. Emissions trading is a concept born here in America 
and it was the United States that insisted it be part of the Kyoto Protocol. While Kyoto established a broad framework, the nitty-gritty rules still had to be negotiated before countries could ratify it. A year ago, those negotiations were at a standstill. Then President Bush rejected the protocol. Suddenly, the rest of the world was rallying to its defense. In negotiations last July in Bonn and last month in Marrakesh, nations made the tough compromises and worked out the rules. They're not perfect, but they do establish a workable international system for beginning to tackle this problem. The agreements in Bonn and Marrakesh have been rightly declared a triumph of multilateralism. They represent, as well, a triumph for the principle of harnessing the global market to protect our global environment. It's true Kyoto's targets take us only a decade into the future and provide only a small fraction of the emission reductions we must ultimately achieve. But the bottom line is that we have to start somewhere, and much of the world has now established that starting point. The priority now is to ensure the protocol's swift ratification and entry into force so we can, at long last, begin to deliver on Kyoto's promise and achieve real progress. What then of the United States? With just 4% of the world's population, we generate 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Each year, our emissions grow higher. We've rejected Kyoto, yet we have no real strategy of our own. I'm afraid I have little expectation that the Bush administration is prepared to put forward the kind of proposals needed to launch a serious effort, at least not at the moment. Nor, for that matter, was the previous administration. But just as President Bush's rejection of Kyoto helped rally international support for the protocol, it has stimulated a very interesting and encouraging bipartisan response on Capitol Hill. Suddenly, both Democrats and Republicans seem eager to demonstrate their commitment to tackling climate change. For instance, Senator Robert Byrd, a leading Democrat from coal-producing West Virginia, and Senator Ted Stevens, a leading Republican from oil-producing Alaska, are teaming up on a bill that would devote billions to, to researching and developing climate-friendly technology. It also would establish a climate change office in the White House and give the president one year to develop a comprehensive strategy aimed at stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. A first step, but an important one. Other bills would require companies to track and disclose their emissions of greenhouse gases, an essential step toward building a comprehensive emissions reduction strategy. This is an idea that the White House seems at least open to considering. In the Senate, there's a serious debate brewing over new pollution standards for power plants. In fact, the first real debate at the federal level over the kind of mandatory controls on carbon dioxide that Oregon already has in place. Finally, another bipartisan duo, Senators John McCain and Joe Lieberman, have said they plan to introduce legislation establishing an emissions trading system covering major sources of greenhouse gases throughout the economy. It's hard to imagine a bill like that moving through Congress anytime soon, but the very idea that two such prominent lawmakers would be advocating such a far-reaching strategy was virtually unthinkable just a year ago. To be certain, there are many in Congress and elsewhere who remain adamantly opposed to concrete action against climate change. Perhaps they assume, in the greatest tradition of laissez-faire economics, that a rising sea level lifts all boats. There are even those who continue to question whether global warming is real. President Bush expressed his own doubts about the science when he first took office. He asked the National Academy of Sciences to undertake a special review. The NAS came back and said, yes, there are some uncertainties in the science. There always will be, I'm sure. But the NAS went on to say that, despite those uncertainties, the evidence for global warming is strong and growing stronger. Here's what the science does tell us. First, the Earth is getting warmer. The 1990s were the hottest decade of the entire millennium, and 1997, 98, and 99 were three of the hottest years ever. Second, this warming trend is almost certain to continue. Projections of future warming suggest an average global increase of 2 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit over the next century. Third, and perhaps most importantly, the evidence strongly suggests that human activities, in particular the burning of fossil fuels, are largely to blame. What will the impacts of this warming be? How will all this affect our children and grandchildren? 
Some people like to see the bright side of global warming. Lower heating bills in winter, for instance, and longer growing seasons in the Midwest. But there's good reason to believe that any potential benefits will be far outweighed by the costs. Rising sea levels will flood coastal areas, a very real, real worry along portions of the US coastline, but a much greater worry for low-lying countries like the Netherlands and Bangladesh. Higher temperatures mean an increase in extreme weather, more flooding, more drought, and more severe storms. Historic patterns of rain and snowfall will be disrupted, putting water supplies at risk. Here in the Pacific Northwest, for instance, warmer winters will mean less snowpack in the mountains and an earlier springtime melt. Many of our most threatened species and ecosystems will face even greater risk. Declines in river flow, for instance, could destroy any chance of saving this region's precious salmon runs. And hotter, drier summers will stress the forests and pose an even greater threat of wildfire. One of the tremendous inequities of climate change is that people facing the greatest risks are those least able to bear them. Wealthy nations like the United States can find ways to lessen the impact. We can build seawalls to protect our coasts. Our farmers can switch to other crops better suited to a warmer climate. We can strengthen our public health system to guard against diseases like malaria and dengue fever. But poorer nations struggling to feed and house their people cannot so easily adapt. And scientists predict that they will be the ones hardest hit. For them, prolonged drought doesn't mean parched lawns and water rationing. It means starvation. Rising sea levels won't just be an inconvenience for those with beachfront property. They'll mean mass migrations and increased competition for scarce land. And lest you think that all of this is conjecture, it's worth noting that the people of Tuvalu, a small island nation in the Pacific, recently decided to abandon their homeland before it's swallowed by rising seas. All 11,000 residents will be relocating to New Zealand beginning next year. So this is the kind of world that awaits us if we continue our present course. What is the alternative? What will it take to keep our planet from overheating? Well, quite obviously, it requires dramatically reducing emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that trap heat in our atmosphere. What is the primary source of these gases? The combustion of fossil fuels. So our goal over time must be to end our reliance on coal and oil and to develop new sources of energy that can power a growing economy without endangering our climate. Yes, it's a tall order, but as I said earlier, it will take nothing short of a second industrial revolution. But let me be clear, this revolution cannot take place overnight. It will, in fact, take decades. But there are important steps we should take right now to begin the transition. First, we need to be more energy efficient, so we lose, use less energy to achieve the same results. The United States has made significant improvements in energy efficiency over the last decade, but countries such as the United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, and Brazil are all far less energy intensive than we are, and we have clearly much further to go. Some of this could be as simple as turning off the lights, buying a compact fluorescent next time you need a new light bulb, or carefully checking the energy efficiency ratings the next time you buy a new washer or dryer. We should also be insisting on more energy efficient cars, and the technology exists. The new Toyota Prius, a hybrid car that uses both electric, an electric motor and an internal combustion engine, can go more than 50 miles on a gallon of gas. It's proven so popular that you have to wait months to get one. If everyone in America drove a hybrid, we would save about 1.6 billion gallons of oil a year, far more than we import from the Middle East. Improving efficiency is not enough, though. To address climate change, we will also have to emit much less carbon, and this means switching to less carbon-intensive fuels. Some fuel switching can be done now, but we need a serious effort to begin laying the groundwork for the fuels of the future. We've been through energy transitions before. In the 18th century, we still relied largely on wood. In the 19th century, the steam engine took over. In the 20th century, we turned to oil. Now we must develop new fuels to meet the needs of the 21st century. I can't tell you what the fuel of choice should be 100 years from now. That'll depend on the ingenuity of our scientists and engineers, 
investment decisions made in boardrooms, the unpredictable course of technological development and the whims of the marketplace. Solar, wind, and geothermal power all hold tremendous promise. But one technology that is generating real interest right now is the hydrogen fuel cell. Fuel cells are what NASA puts on board rockets to generate power in space. They can run on different kinds of fuels. But whatever the fuel source, the only byproduct is heat and water, pure water. In other words, no smog-forming pollutants and no carbon dioxide. Fuel cells could be used to power cars, and many automakers are now engaged in efforts to make fuel cell cars a reality. They could be used to power businesses or homes. Instead of buying electricity from a coal-burning utility, a fuel cell in your basement, no bigger than a central air conditioner, could generate all the clean power you need. The use of hydrogen, this is a bit of a, of a sort of a, a leap into the future here. The use of hydrogen to power fuel cells is appealing because there are so many different ways to produce it. Hydrogen can be extracted from coal, oil, or natural gas, or preferably produced from renewable energy sources. And it can take different forms. Some energy experts envision the day when instead of filling your car at a gas pump, you'll pick up fuel in a box from the convenience store or a vending machine. You could go, they say, about 250 miles on a six-pack. That's just one possibility, and there are many, many more. The point is that if we are to realize them, if we are to discover and pursue the most promising options, we must get started. The second industrial revolution requires technological and economic transformations on an unprecedented scale, and we must begin making investments now to ensure its success. There are those who say we can't afford to address climate change, particularly when our economy is slowing. I believe they are wrong for a host of reasons. I could tell you how the economic models they rely on exaggerate the costs of cutting emissions and fail to take into account the full range of benefits. But instead, let me tell you about the concrete experiences of the companies we work with at the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. 37 major companies are now members of our Business Environmental Leadership Council. They are primarily five, Fortune 500 companies, names you'd recognize like Weyerhaeuser, Intel, Boeing, DuPont, Shell, and Alcoa. Together, these companies employ more than two million people and generate revenues of nearly $900 billion a year. And through their investments in emissions cutting and climate-friendly technologies, they are demonstrating what is good for the climate can be good, too, for the bottom line. Many of these companies adopted voluntary targets for reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. We recently re released a report that took a close look at six of them. It looked at the reasons why they took on targets and what the results have been. The companies said one of the motivations for taking on a target was to improve their competitive positioning in the marketplace. And that, in fact, has been the result. Each of the companies is on track to meeting or exceeding its greenhouse gas goal. Together, they've delivered reductions equal to the annual emissions of 3 million cars. And all the companies are finding that their efforts are helping to reduce production costs and enhance product sales today. So yes, I'm confident that with smart strategies that tap the power of the marketplace instead of squelching it, that do not expect more than can be delivered, and that take into account capital stock turnover cycles, we can afford to address climate change. In fact, we can strengthen the long-term health of our economy. Whatever the economic indicators for the latest quarter, over the long haul, increased efficiencies can only improve the bottom line. There are real economic opportunities that come with taking action on climate change. It would be a mistake not to seize them. Before closing, I'd like to say a word about our new concerns now dominating our national agenda. I refer, of course, to the horrible, haunting events of September 11th. The security of our nation is now, and will for some time remain, the overriding concern in Washington, and with good reason. As a result, a host of other issues, climate change among them, will take a lower profile. But I believe those of us working on climate change can still make an important contribution. We can help show how, with the right strategies, we can both protect our nation and advance the fight against global warming. This is most obvious in the case of energy security. 
We all know that continuing to rely so heavily on imported oil is a costly mistake. To some, the answer is drilling in the Arctic refuge. But whatever your views on the Arctic, it is clear that no amount of domestic drilling will significantly reduce our reliance on foreign oil. If we are serious about energy security, whether or not we're serious about addressing climate change, we must move beyond oil. So where are we in the effort against climate change? Internationally, after a decade of difficult negotiations, we are for the first time on the verge of enacting binding emission limits for all industrialized countries but one. In the United States, despite our refusal to join the rest of the world in the Kyoto Protocol, a growing bipartisan recognition that we cannot continue to blithely ignore our responsibilities as the world's largest greenhouse gas polluter. In a growing number of boardrooms, corporate leaders are seeing climate change not only as a challenge, but as an opportunity. And in communities like Portland, ordinary citizens are acting locally to meet what is truly a global challenge. We have a long, long way to go, but we have begun, and that is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was challenging. Uh, my question uh, may appear somewhat heretical, at least uh, to this audience at this moment. I'd like to, for the sake of argument, challenge the premise uh, that human activity is a major factor in current global warming. It appears that the evidence that global warming is occurring is conclusive. What does remain controversial, though, is the cause, and you alluded to that to a degree. There are those who point out that the Earth has experienced periods of heating and cooling since the beginning. Ice ages have come and ice ages have gone with subsequent warming and flooding. Uh, two questions then. What is the evidence that the current warming trend is caused substantially by the burning of fossil fuels? And secondly, how are those who maintain that fossil fuels are not the culprit to be convinced otherwise? Um, on the first question, I should start off by saying I'm not a scientist. My degrees are in English literature. Um, but I'll try it anyway, because it's, uh, it's my line of work here. Um, I think if you look at natural variation over uh, hundreds of years, you will see sort of an up and down continuously where there is natural variation. Things did happen and, and so on. But I think what you're seeing now is totally different. And if I had a chart, I would show you all of this, and then I would show you this. Um, and quite honestly, um, I think even the skeptics um, allow is how it's probably at least partly human-induced. What, what that group of scientists is now saying is there are all these other factors, which is true, and there are uncertainties, which is true, um, and maybe it'll be good for you, they're saying now. So I actually think um, they've gotten a little bit past this issue of is it human-induced, because I think it's pretty clear um, that at least some amount of it is human-induced. And since that's the part we can deal with, I think we should. Um, you asked about the fossil fuel companies. Um, I think it's interesting that three oil companies are part of my 37 and one coal mining company. Um, I think the oil companies that have joined with me, and even some that are thinking about this in much more constructive ways, um, have decided that really they're energy companies, not oil companies. And their job is to provide energy and molecules and that's the business they're in, and so they're investing in hydrogen, and they're investing in renewables, and they're you know, investing in solar because their job is to provide what it takes to make this great engine of our economy go. Um, that's one thing. I think there is no question that there are some companies, like the coal industry, who would not fare well if you actually decide that you're gonna stop coal and go beyond that, but you know, We've been through lots of transitions like this in the past, some naturally because new technology has come along and some because of, of a government effort. And I think our job is to minimize the impacts and find a way to do that, not to ignore the evidence and not to move forward as I think we need to. I, 
I mean, thanks for coming to Portland. Eric Sten, City Club member, and I'm on the Portland City Council. Uh, quite in Portland, we actually made substantial progress on this issue in the 90s, and at the same time, the economy was very good. And the thesis I'd put forward to you is those are actually very related. Um, most of our, our uh, steps forward came from things that didn't have to do with global warming, transit usage, land use planning, tree planning, et cetera, so some energy efficiency steps. And I think why we, and it, now is not a great time because the economy is not great right now in Portland, but I think why we did well in the 90s was that we had a high quality of life. Um, and I think those two things are very related. Are you seeing people, the quality of life to the economy in this country? And what I don't think people have done is made that link between local action and the economics. And while I think it's very important to transform the corporations, I think there's a message coming from cities like Portland that could be useful in your work. Are you hearing that anywhere? Um, actually, I'm not, because I, I think, I mean, there are a number of stages you have to go through, I think, if you want to deal with this problem. The first one are, th are things that relate to efficiency. They're the easiest, they're the cheapest, they don't, they, don't they don't affect whether you have a good economy or not, because in fact, they tend to save you money. It's when you start the next phase, which are infrastructure changes and things where you're moving to things that are more expensive, where an economy in the doldrums is not an ideal situation. It's my view that we actually haven't gotten past the first phase um, throughout this country, whether it's in corporations or in local governments. And so I'm hopeful we can use this time, however long it is, and I'm not a, I can't project uh, either, to do the first kinds of things and start planning for the next phase. Hi, I'm Tom Dunn, a uh, member. Um, Businesses say they just give the consumer what uh, he or she wants, and they're sort of helpless in, um, uh, in this environment of the all-powerful consumer. Uh, well, I'm a consumer, and what I want is to deal only to the extent as possible with those 30-some-odd companies that are now supporting you and be kept informed about other companies that are joining in and, and more informed about your program too. And uh, so uh, I guess you can do that. Are you doing that in general? And you can, yeah, I'm sure you can help me out. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying to do that as much as we can. It's one reason I came out to Portland. We have a very active website, um, and I don't know if that's a medium that you like to use, but we, we have had, un, I mean, hundreds of thousands of of user sessions, we have had our reports download. I mean, the ones, for example, that describe what companies are doing, you know, downloaded in the thousands um, by month. Um, we have lots of things we can do, and um, my director of communications is here, and she'll load you up with as much as you want. I, sh I should correct one thing, or just sort of make it clear. We don't actually we work with these companies because we agree on where we need to go and how to do it. We don't actually take any funding from them because. I think it's important that we be independent and, and they have their independence, that we work together because we share the same goals, not because they paid me to say something. Tom Deering, City Club member. Uh, a a two-part question. One is, uh, many of us are pretty dubious about the role of atomic power in resolving this. I'd like to have your comments on that. And secondly, uh, could you discuss a little bit which of the alternative uh, energy, air, or solar, or whatever, uh, are the most promising and what's happening there and uh, uh, how it's progressing? Um, on nuclear power, we have tended to be neutral. Um, it's sort of my, I mean, there's no question from a global warming point of view um, that nuclear power doesn't have the same kinds of emissions that coal-fired power does. Um, but there are other environmental issues that are problems with nuclear power. And I think until they get worked out, like this storage and disposal issue, I'm not sure we're going to see any growth in nuclear power. My guess is we will relicense all the existing nuclear power plants, um, but that's probably where it will end. I should say that of the 37 companies, we have a couple that have a fair amount of nuclear, um, and they think nuclear is part of the solution. Um, I myself would like to see all the other issues dealt with before I'm willing to say that. Uh, on, the, on the other kinds of things, it's very hard to pick the winners. Um, and I think in the end, 
it's important to go across as wide a range as possible, see what we can do with, with all of those choices, and that the winners will emerge. So, I mean, I spent some time talking about hydrogen and the hydrogen fuel cell because I think, I think that's one of the things that is most promising. But wind is starting to be cost competitive in a lot of places, and that can easily be part of the solution. I'm not sure there's any one answer to this. I think we're going to have a whole array of different kinds of fuels, just different than the array that we have now. So I, again, I don't, want to, I don't want to pick the winners. I want to see them all flourish and have the winners sort of emerge. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, transportation seems to be one of the major contributors to global warming. Uh, and yet, in the aftermath of uh, September 11, uh, we are providing liberal assistance to the airlines, uh, and we're continuing to finance the expansion of roads and so on. At the same time, we're thinking about uh, liquidating Amtrak, and uh, I don't know what we're doing about public transit, but probably not too much. In Oregon, particularly serious, uh, we have a, probably the most restrictive constitutional restriction on the use of gas taxes for automobile related expansion only. Uh, what about that? Um, transportation accounts for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. And in the end, you can't solve it unless you deal with transportation. Um, it's, politically, it's a nightmare. Um, because um, most presidents feel they need Michigan to win, um, to, be, to be blunt about it. Um, and there are all kinds of politics with the auto companies and the oil industry, actually. Um, my, my own sense is that it's, it's probably going to, you can make enormous strides in efficiency from existing automobiles, which would make a huge dent. And we know exactly how to do that. And the auto companies know exactly how to do that. And of course, they do make the argument that the other gentleman raised, and that is that the consumer demands particular automobiles, and they, of course, just produce what the consumers demand. I, I think we're going to have to be technological about that piece of the solution. And that is why I think the hybrid cars are a great transition and fuel cell cars will be really helpful. I don't know that we can get Americans out of their automobiles, um, quite honestly. And if you look around the world, um, it's, it's the United States squared or, or, or times three or times five. I mean, you can't actually, if you go to Thailand, you can't actually move in your vehicle. You sit in it uh, for hours at a time to go three blocks. Um, so transit has, mass transit has a role to play. It's not, it's not being looked at, I think, in the sort of way that it should be. But in the end, I think we're going to have to find some technological solutions and move ahead that way. Harriet Watson, City Club board member. And I'm channeling this question from an eighth grader from Arbor School who's sitting at my table. And she's wondering if you could identify some companies that are really emerging as industry leaders in developing new fuel sources? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I think there are two oil companies who have made significant investments in other fuel sources, and they are BP and Shell. Um, in contrast, for example, to ExxonMobil or some of the others. Um, they have also made commitments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from their own operations. Um, and BP has already met theirs, and Shell actually has already met theirs. And both were actually more stringent than the US requirements under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so not only are they sort of doing what they can within their own operations, but they're also starting to make serious investments. I think there are a number of companies that are involved in fuel cells and um, auto technology and things like that. Um, it's the ones you would expect. I mean, maybe I don't have to list them, but I, you know, the, the European automakers and the Japanese automakers are far ahead of the US automakers, no surprise there, which is not to say that the US automakers aren't involved in some of this. They are, but on a slightly smaller scale and in a slightly longer time frame. Um, I think if you look at my list of 37, which will probably be 40, I think, within a couple of months, um, that's probably a pretty good list of who the leaders are. And if, if you don't have it, we'll find a way to advertise it more. 
but there are also some who aren't part of us who are moving in this direction. I, I don't want to claim all the, all the good guys, just most of them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Burnett, Executive Director of the Climate Trust. I guess, would you care to comment on the, how the United States' policy of not of disengaging from Kyoto is perceived in other parts of the world, um, maybe by governments, businesses over there, the common, common person, and, and also maybe how it affects the competitiveness of U.S. companies. What are you hearing from your companies? Um, I think the rest of the world was truly shocked when the president made his announcement in March of this year that we were withdrawing from the Kyoto process. Um, because n nobody, expect, nobody had any expectation that that would be the case. And it was done in a, it wasn't, having once been a diplomat, it wasn't done in the most diplomatic way. It was just sort of sent in a letter um, from the president to two senators. Um, and that is how the rest of the world learned about it. Um, I think they've actually sort of gotten over that a little bit. And they have reflected a little bit on the fact that the prior administration, I mean, I am being bipartisan here, the prior administration talked a very good game um, and negotiated some agreements that they had no ability to, to deliver on. And in fact, didn't do anything that would allow them to deliver on them. So there is actually some number of people abroad who would say, well, at least we know where the United States really is, um, which is not at the table with us doing the right things. I, I think they are all hoping that we take on some targets and do some stuff here at home. Um, and if we are able to show that we are taking some steps and reducing emissions, I think the rest of the world would be truly relieved and would try to find a way to make whatever system we develop here and whatever systems they have there converge into one global system, because in the end you need a global system. So at the moment, um, and, I'm, and I talk to these people all the time, they're waiting to see what it is that we're going to do, if anything, to see if there's some way to make the whole world come together on this at some at some future time. Most of the companies in my list of 37 are multinationals, um, and many of them manufacture abroad. And so they will have to live with whatever the rules are in those countries. From their perspective, it would be much better if we had a more uniform set of rules and an overarching system, because in that way, they could be more efficient across their own operations, figure out where the reductions would be easiest, figure out how to make the changes that needed to be, to be made. They're also a little worried about things that might be taken to the World Trade Organization because our energy prices are much lower because we're not dealing with climate change. And they're a little worried about discrimination against companies that are US-based because the US is not a player. I don't honestly know whether any of that will come to anything. There's been a little bit of talk. There's been um, some discussion, particularly in the European Parliament, about that. Whether it comes to anything or not, I'm not sure. And I think the key will be that we do something here at home. Because once it's clear that we're actually taking this seriously and doing something, the whole dynamic, which is a little bit sort of anti-US on this and other issues, will change. Um, and that's why, I mean, from my perspective, the greatest effort has to be at home. Um, because once we do some things here, we're in a much different position to influence the rest of the world and to actually get this problem solved. Chip Greening, City Club member. Here at the City Club, um, we engage in a favorite pastime of beating up on corporations as responsible for uh, global change or name the other subject that you want. And yet it appears that our inordinate use of hydrocarbons in the United States is largely the result of consumer choices. For example, we don't ride Ray Polanyi's trains and we drive cars that are too big. You mentioned earlier that the September 11th events, which we have seen have been a galvanizing event uh, to do something about terrorism, which we could see coming if we looked hard enough before that event. And yet, climate change is a little bit like the story of the frog getting slowly boiled to death by starting out in cold water and ending up in boiling water. Uh, there's no galvanizing point at which uh, we decide, ah, yes, the water has risen in the oceans by a, another foot, so now we need to do something about it. Is there, could there be a galvanizing event? And oh, by the way, I would add that people like you have been trying to raise the alarm for many years. Uh, that hasn't seemed to do it. <laughs> what, 
what could, as what I could am. motivate <laughs> citizens in the United States, in particular, to take personal actions which would help reduce the use of hydro hydrocarbons? Well, I'd actually like to address two parts of that. Um, the first part is your comment about people in the city club always taking on the corporations. I mean, I actually think on this issue, the corporations are way ahead of both the public and, and our publicly elected officials. Um, the public, because they seem unable or unwilling to make the connection between what they do and this problem. In other words, if you look at all the polling that's been done on this, um, the public says, yes, they absolutely agree that this is a problem and that somebody else should solve it. And they don't seem to make any, any, any relationship between what they purchase and what they do and this problem. And I don't know if that's a question of education or, or what it is that will make that change. Um, publicly elected officials, of course, you know, sort of wait to see what they hear from the public in their state or in the country as a whole. And if they don't, they hear that this is a problem in some parts of the country, not in others. I had an interesting meeting with Senator Larry Craig, um, who's in the Republican leadership in the Senate and quite conservative, who said that he's actually interested in the subject and he's actually quite knowledgeable on the science and has some ideas about how to deal with it. Not, not too aggressive, but some, some ideas on how to deal with it. But who says when he goes back to Idaho, no one in three years has ever raised this issue with him. I mean, nobody's ever said, could you do something about this? So anything he does is based on his own desires, which in this case are not overwhelming. <laughs> but I mean, there is, the fact is there is no sort of broad public interest in, in taking some action here. And political leaders who get out on this are, are ahead of them. And corporations who get out of, on this are, are also ahead, uh, ahead. Now, would it take a major catastrophe uh, to make people deal with this? I, I know on another issue that I um, spent an enormous amount of time on, and that was the ozone layer issue, um, I would say there were two things that, that mobilized the public. One was the picture of the hole in the ozone layer, which made a lot of people say, there's something here, and we had probably better do something about it. And in that case, the private sector actually had some substitutes on the market and were able to sort of move through that in, in, a, in a relatively reasonable way. Um, the other thing that galvanized the American public on that was incidents of skin cancer, um, which got a lot of people sort of interested in this and got the public officials interested in this. Um, one of the people who ran for office in the last presidential election was waiting for a, a catastrophe on climate um, to show that, that something had to be done so that he could actually do something about it. Um, another aside, which I probably shouldn't say since this is being televised, but uh, <laughs> um, I would hope that we could do something about this without some incident like that. But no, my efforts haven't been altogether successful, but the fact that you invited me here and there are so many people in this audience is a good sign. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sharon Joyce, City Club member and wheelchair couch potato. Uh, I think that we are always working for either an Eden or a hell or purgatory. And uh, maybe you were tactful enough not to mention that war uh, is also a global warming thing as well as uh, more people because everything we do uh, whether it's cutting trees or putting down concrete or putting our water underground is going to warm the planet. So, um, incidentally, I just wanted to mention that Fortune magazine said that Toyota had uh, hydrogen cells in their new cars. They so, do. Um, Portland is our home. And in my... Where do we start? Yeah, because... If we are to limit our population, which is also necessary for this global warming thing, and to do something in the line of solar so that w we can help our own businessmen and our own residents uh, prosper, where do you think we should start? Well, I think you're actually, you're already starting. I mean, I don't want to say you've finished, but you're starting. Um, you're starting with some of the transportation things that you're doing in the city of Portland. Somebody told me last night that 
um, the city was giving up its sport utility vehicles and moving to uh, hybrid uh, Toyotas, which I thought was, was really good. Um, you know, what if everybody did that? Um, so I actually think one job for Portland, if I was going to give you a homework assignment, since I already got it several, um, is that maybe you should talk a little bit about what you're doing with others who are interested in doing some things. Because quite honestly, you may, you may not think you're very far along, and you know, in a grand scale, you're probably not. Um, but a lot of little things will make a difference here. And some of the things that are going on in Portland, if they could only be replicated in I would say as, as soon as the vehicles come on the market, which will not be long from now, yes, you can. Brian Red, City Club member. Eileen, as you're aware, when President Bush uh, rejected Kyoto, one of his primary reasons was it would be too harmful to the U.S. economy. Um, yet you have pointed out in, in your presentation today, and, and it's been reported elsewhere, that many companies who represent some of the primary drivers of the U.S. economy, and to that extent the global economy, have found that reducing their greenhouse gas emissions uh, has resulted in a financial advantage. Can you reconcile that? Yes, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I mean, those who would like not to do anything on this issue have found economic models that, in my view, are not reflective of reality put in the worst assu possible assumptions to show the greatest possible harm. And, and I would say that people on the other side have done exactly the same thing. They found the economic models and put in the assumptions that would show that it's everything we do here is going to be free. And the reality is, of course, I think it's not going to bankrupt the economy, but it's probably not free either. Some steps could be free, but beyond that, they won't be. Um, and actually, we've done a huge amount of work looking at taking apart all those models. Um, and I don't want to go into all the reasons why, but they, they use models that are good for the next year to reflect 20 years out. Well, that shows no flexibility in the economy. I mean, everything happens to, you, you say it, it's going to happen, it happens tomorrow, and then the worst possible effects happen. Well, that's actually, it's, it's not honest, um, actually, you know, to, be, to be blunt about it. So I don't actually want to get into sort of the dueling models, although, we are doing a lot of work on that so that we're prepared in the event that that becomes the issue. I think the best way to deal with it is to show that there are people who are doing it and who are finding that, in fact, it doesn't hurt them. That's much more real, and that will resonate much more with public officials than me arguing about why the mine workers use the DRI model, <laughs> which I'm prepared to do if anyone really wants to hear about it. Um, but I think the other is a much more persuasive way to say, I mean, let's just get real about, about this, and let's just be honest about it. Some people will be hurt, and we should figure out how to help them. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't address a problem that's as serious as this. Good afternoon. Tuck Wilson, City Club veteran. I have appreciated your informative remarks this afternoon. They really have been inspiring. I wonder if you assume for a moment the reductions contemplated in Kyoto could you speculate how long it would be before the warming trend begins to cool? Um, I, I guess the easiest way to answer that is to say that the Kyoto reductions don't mean anything in the big scheme of things. Um, they don't mean anything because they are relative, even though they could be onerous, they are relatively small, um, and they only are being taken on by a very limited number of countries. And so when you consider growth in emissions in the United States and in many, many other parts of the world, the fact that 30 countries are actually limiting their emissions a little bit in the next 10 years, honestly, doesn't mean anything, which is, which is why I think what you really need is a second industrial revolution, which you better start planning for now and implementing as you can now, so that in 30 years or 40 years, you can make a massive change in infrastructure and in fuels used and in everything else as the capital stock. I mean, I'm not interested in ruining the economy either. As the capital stock turns over, you replace it with things that make a real difference. Um, so Kyoto is important because it's a sign of will um, and because you really do have to start somewhere. Um, but it by itself, I mean, it is, it is not close to what we really need here.
Thank you very much for coming. My name is Heather Busey. I've just moved back to Oregon about six months ago. One of the reasons I chose to come back to Oregon was because of the strong commitment to the MAX and Urban Boat Growth Boundaries. You all have a lot to be proud of, and thank you very much, City Club, for bringing Eileen here. I spent the last year trying to raise money for an ocean wave energy conversion company. They developed technology to convert the up and down motion of the waves into electricity. Went and met with corporate potential corporate partners, venture capital fairs, and unfortunately because of the technology bust that we all experienced in our Yahoo stock, the same thing happened with a lot of venture capital that was out there for really neat energy technologies. And I saw everything this summer from fuel cells, microturbines, solar, wind technologies, ocean wave, Corbin Motors, the small commuter vehicle. There it, you give an engineer a challenge and they can solve it. There are amazing things out there. Now I'm getting to my question. <laughs> the private capital is there to some degree. It ebbs and flows with the economy. In the various states I've lived in, um, I lived in Arizona before and here in Oregon now, we have um, portfolio standards which require um, a certain degree of your electricity to come from renewable sources. At the same time, I was thrilled to get an announcement from PGE recently that I can elect to pay extra for solar energy and, and wind. I'm, I'm thrilled by that. But what I want to know is, with all these private and state initiatives, what would it take to, to inspire some form of national initiative? Well, I mean, you'd have to create enough demand to make it a reality, right? I mean, that's a re I mean, I think that's sort of the reality. As, and you'd have to make sure that the cost was competitive in some way or subsidized in some way so that people would do it, right? I mean, it's, the, it's those two things. One of the things that's really interesting is that there now are, are a group of major energy-intensive corporations who have gotten together who, wanna, who want to purchase large chunks of green energy. Um, and because they are large users, that might make a difference. I mean, you really need a lot of users or some really big users to say, this is what we want, and then I think the marketplace can deliver. Um, so I, I mean, I, I do think that's part of it, and I forgot already what my second answer was. <laughs> Sorry. If I remember, I'll find you. We've got time for one more oh, question. There we go. Andrew Maybe Wheeler. I won't. Then it's Andrew Wheeler, <laughs> member. Um, I have a feeling that a galvanizing um, event might be uh, something that would line our pockets. In other words, if it, if it pays, then we would do it. And uh, I was listening to public radio oh, two months ago, I think, Ira Flato, I'm not sure, uh, who was talking about wind energy. And he was saying, I think, that if wind energy uh, plants or farms were in South Dakota, that not only would it be a crop, finally, that could make something, uh, make the farmer wealthier, but that it could basically supply 80% of our energy in this country. Is that, is that, yes, did, I, did I forget the no, that's program? A, no, that's a, <laughs> no, you're right on. It's interesting that the farm bill is now being debated um, in the Congress and there is some chance that we actually will have a farm bill before the Congress goes out. And it is interesting that in this farm bill for the first time, um, there's a lot of stuff there on biofuels and wind um, which, are, which are being advocated by the farmers and w where I believe there is some bipartisan consensus that we ought to move in exactly that direction. So not only are you not sort of smoking anything, but I think you're right on. <laughs>